text from the Gospel reading, Matthew chapter 18. In Jesus' name, amen. We all know what it means to settle accounts. In this life, everything has a price, and sooner or later we have to pay up. Whether it involves rent, or mortgage, or car payments, or credit cards, or the numbers at the gas station, we understand about settling accounts. When it comes to settling the account of someone who has sinned against us, the desire to settle accounts may be even more deeply ingrained. The way the world deals with sin is an eye for an eye, or do unto others the same hurt they have done to you, or maybe a little more. That kind of desire is rooted deeply in us. Jesus had been teaching the disciples about life in the body of Christ, life as a member of the kingdom of heaven. Once again, in today's gospel, Jesus shows that the values and behaviors of this kingdom are different than the values and behaviors in the rest of the world. Just before this, Jesus had been teaching and dealing with injured relationships in the kingdom. We heard that last week. He reminded them that the goal was restored health and harmony in the body of Christ by winning back the brother. Jesus showed them that it involves repentance on the one part and forgiveness on the other part. Peter must have been starting to catch on. He asked the question we hear today, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And before we go on to Jesus' answer, we need to recognize that Peter's suggestion is a step in the right direction. The normal ideal for Jewish religious teaching in those days was a limit of three times to forgive someone for the same wrong. Peter has doubled that normal limit and added one more for good measure. His understanding of the willingness to forgive was growing. And that's because of Jesus. Yet Jesus' answer must have surprised Peter and the others. Jesus says 77 times or 70 times 7. It kind of depends on the translation. We're not completely sure which way to read those Greek numbers from that language of long ago. Some translators fall in one direction, some in the other. But still, it's a huge number compared to Peter's seven, right? It's either a multiple of ten or a multiple of seven and ten going on, both of which numbers in their minds represented completeness. The numbers are so far beyond Peter's suggestion in order to show that forgiveness is not to be counted on a scorecard. I love scorecards, but this is not the place to use one, right? Jesus is saying, don't withhold forgiveness by setting a limit on the number of chances a person gets to repent. If repentance is sincere, forgiveness must not be denied. Now in his question, Peter uses a specific Greek word for sin. There are several Greek words for different kinds of sin just as there are several Greek words for different kinds of love. This one, Peter uses, is the word hamartano. It's a word that means to miss the mark, like you're shooting at a target and you miss, or to be off the target, or to err from what is right. This word is generally used to talk about sin against another person, not usually in talking about our sin against God. To miss the mark may not seem such a terrible thing at first, but think of it about shooting a bow or an arrow. Shooting a bow and arrow or handling a gun. You intend to hit a paper target or whatever your target is, but if you're not completely careful, you can endanger the lives of people around you. To miss the mark in sin, to sin against someone else, but to miss the mark in doing so can cause a great deal of hurt. It's not that you're intending to hurt that person, you intended to do something, but it missed what was right and you injured somebody else. It can hurt people we never intended to hurt. 
missing the mark is serious business, even when the outcome isn't a stray bullet taking a life, like we hear in the news so often. Jesus tells a parable about a king who plans to settle accounts. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And he gives a picture of divine justice at work. We may not often like to think about divine justice, but we had better see the truth of it. We are all called to settle accounts before God, both day by day and especially on our last day. In the first case, the debtor had a debt of an astronomical sum. The talent is not a human skill in this language. The talent is a measure of weight. 75 pounds by most accounts. Some people think it was up to 110 pounds. We're going to talk about 75 pounds as the weight for this talent. If this was a debt in gold, 75 pounds per talent would be about $21 billion by today's market price. Even if it was a debt in silver instead of gold, it would still be over $250 million of debt. This debtor may well have been the king's major manager of his accounts. Who else could run up some kind of a debt like that? The debtor does not come before his king willingly. He has to be brought, hauled in. He probably hoped and thought this day would never come, especially if he was the one with the books. He probably thought he could cover it up, but it's been found out. He is unable to pay. The king orders him and his family sold into slavery to get some kind of a small return on his debt. The man begs for patience. Give me time and I will pay it all back. He's now terrified of the penalty. But somehow, he still thinks he can get himself out of trouble. That idea is just plain foolish. Because he has a debt he will never be able to repay. In spite of this servant's foolish ideas of self-reliance, somehow the king is moved to mercy. Not only does he cancel the punishment, he cancels the debt too. The servant is sent away scot-free. Jesus is giving us a picture of our position before his Father. Our condition is an astronomical debt piled up by our whole life of sin. We like to think Judgment Day will never come. When we do finally realize our sin, we somehow still like to think we can do something about it ourselves to change ourselves to become good enough, at least to be better than others, and good enough to take care of part of that debt. We try to bargain with God. It's a pathetic effort, let me tell you, when we try to bargain with God and think we can do something about our sin. In settling accounts, divine justice by rights should send us, everyone, to eternal punishment. But divine mercy in the person of Jesus Christ steps in, canceling not only the punishment, but the debt itself by taking it all on himself. The Augsburg Confession was the first official statement of our Lutheran forefathers in the Reformation almost 500 years ago. This whole idea that our God settles accounts for us is summed up in Article 4. And you might think it'd be a long, drawn-out thing. It's one little paragraph. Here it is. And we call it the central or most important teaching of the Christian faith. It is also taught among us that we cannot obtain forgiveness of sin and righteousness before God by our own merits, works, or satisfactions, but that we receive forgiveness of sins, and become righteous before God by grace, for Christ's sake, through faith, when we believe that Christ suffered for us, and that for His sake, our sin is forgiven, and righteousness and eternal life are given to us. 
For God will regard and reckon this faith as righteousness, as Paul says in Romans 3, 21 to 26, and Romans 4, verse 5. That's it. It's all about what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Now, so far, the parable makes us happy and greatly comforted, but then comes the unexpected twist that Jesus always seems to have in a parable. This servant, who's just been under a tremendous debt and is now free, now finds himself face to face with another servant. Now he finds himself in the place of the master, the king. Someone else owes him. But instead of this huge impossible debt, millions or even billions of dollars, this is a relatively small debt. A hundred denarii. A denarii was a day's wage for a common worker. A hundred days' wages. For us, that'd be about 20 weeks of pay, right? Less than a half year of wages. You can calculate in your own mind what it would be for you or what it would be for a common person. It's a drop in the bucket compared to what had just been forgiven. That first servant demands payment. The fellow servant begs for time to repay in nearly the same words that the first man had used. In this case, repayment is within the realm of possibility. It might have to be a long time payment plan, but the first servant has the second man thrown into prison. He had received overwhelming mercy, but he's unwilling to pass on even a little bit of mercy to another. The picture for us should be frighteningly clear. Our sin against God is huge and it's freely forgiven. Other people's sin against us, by comparison, is relatively small, but we often refuse to forgive those things. The king hears about it. His other servants saw what happened in both cases and they know the second event is not right, and they come and tell him. They were greatly distressed, Jesus says. I think maybe that's why also he uses the word that Matthew records, hamartano, it misses the mark, that's a sin. What easily hurt this first, the second man who got thrown into prison also hurt other members of the household. It upset them. Sin within the body of Christ usually hurts more than just the one who is wrong. It affects everybody around. The servants can't do anything about it themselves, but they turn it over to the king. And now the king is furious with this wicked servant. The king showed amazing mercy to him and expected to see that mercy reflected in the man's actions to others. Now, because the servant was unwilling to pass on even a little bit of mercy, the king makes the final penalty worse than the beginning. Maybe we wonder, well, if the debt was forgiven, how can he put a penalty on it? He's the king. He can do it because the king is the authority. Right? The man is not just thrown into jail, but one of the gospels says he will be tortured there until it's all paid. And if he couldn't pay it back in the first place, he's never going to pay it back now, which means that his suffering is never going to end. It's a picture of hell. And then the parable ends. We don't know if the heart of this first servant ever changed. Maybe the terror of divine justice would remind him of the tremendous divine mercy that had been offered to him that he had wasted. We look at this as the workings of law and gospel. We know that as long as life continues for us, we have every opportunity to confess our sins and receive God's pardon. But make no mistake, there is a final reckoning. And since we don't know when that's going to be, whether a sickness in the world around us that takes us, or 
a heart within us that fails us, or an auto accident that takes us and somebody else, or a world war, or just normal death, we don't know when it's going to be. It could be in the next instant, it could be years from now, but we don't know. As long as this life continues, we must take advantage of the daily opportunities we have to ask forgiveness from our King and to offer forgiveness to those who owe us. Jesus compels us to forgive others from your heart. That means not just polite words on the outside, but in truth from our whole self. Forgiving words might satisfy other people, but God sees the heart. God's forgiveness to us is real and complete, but if it doesn't change our hearts to forgive others, it's as if the cross of Jesus was a waste. As if we had never been forgiven. Where we recognize that hardness of heart in us, where we have problems forgiving someone, we need to confess it to God and ask forgiveness for that attitude. To ask God, please change my heart. And then we seek and say, God, please help me find a way to pass on forgiveness to that person that I so struggle with. The last paragraph of Lincoln's second inaugural address is a human example of this attitude of forgiveness. This was at a time when the Civil War was still dragging on. He spoke these words, and probably you recognize them. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall bore the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Those are words about healing. As we are faced with settling accounts with those who have sinned against us, let us always remember that divine mercy, that huge divine mercy that has wiped out our debt of sin because of our Lord Jesus Christ. By His grace, let us daily strive to confess our sin and then to reflect His mercy to those around us. It's not easy. This is not the way of the world. It's not the way that our nature wants us to live. It is the way of the new life and the new kingdom that Christ has put into our hearts through His Word and sacraments. This is how we can live now together in the body of Christ. This is what can happen because Christ lives in us. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in this Christ Jesus. Amen.